Canada's central bank gave its end of the year speech and they have some warnings that are going to impact every single Canadian, their money, their houses, and their jobs. Now, on top of all this, they outline a major change that could send us on a vastly different path than other nearby countries, while other analysts are pointing out that the real numbers are actually worse than the numbers that we're currently being presented with. So let's talk about why this is happening, how it's about to have some serious repercussions on the entire economy, and what you can personally do to come out ahead. Now, let's get into first what the Bank of Canada's warnings are, but you need to understand that the stated goal of the Bank of Canada is to return inflation back to their 2% target. That's what, in their eyes, is most important, and they're going to sacrifice almost anything to get us there. Now, the Bank of Canada really only have a couple of tools that they can use to do that. The most obvious one is interest rates. With higher rates for longer, Canadians end up feeling poorer as the cost to finance anything is increased, while the value of the assets that many Canadians hold are held down by these higher rates. Now, this is supposed to make people spend less, reducing demand, and as a result, uh, reducing inflation. The second tool that they can use is something called forward guidance, but we'll get into that in just a second. Uh, this fear of inflation is actually why the Bank of Canada is sending out these warnings in the first place. Listen to this clip from the governor of the Bank of Canada's speech that happened just last week. With the cost of living still increasing too quickly and with growth subdued, the next two to three quarters will be difficult for many. Consumers will continue to hold back spending. Businesses will see weak demand and employment will probably grow more slowly than the labor force. That means the unemployment rate will likely increase further. That brings me to the inflation outlook. As growth slows, inflation pressures will ease, but we can't rule out some bumps along the way. Since the Bank of Canada isn't fully convinced that inflation will actually stay down, they're willing to allow the unemployment rate to increase to make sure that inflation doesn't come back. And right now, one of the primary drivers of inflation in Canada is, yep, you guessed it, shelter or, or housing costs, right? This is something that Macklem emphasizes in this very same speech. Rent was up 8.2% in October. This strength in shelter price inflation appears to be related to the structural lack of supply in housing. Canada's housing supply has not kept up with growth in our population, and higher rates of immigration are widening the gap. So the Bank of Canada points the housing cost inflation blame at the lack of supply of housing relative to Canada's absolutely massive population growth this year. And, and interestingly, when I take a closer look at some of the notes the Bank of Canada recently released about the changes they've made, it, it seems to me that this shortage might not stop them from making a change that could actually reignite the rapid housing price growth that we saw in 2020 and 2021. Let's take a closer look at that. But first I want to take a second to thank the sponsor of today's video and that's Private Internet Access. Private Internet Access is a VPN which allows you to hide your IP address and encrypt your internet connection. Now it's super important to have a VPN because it helps to shield your digital life from the eyes of people you might not want seeing it and that includes your internet provider, network administrators, and even potential government sensors. Now one common use of a VPN is to make your computer think that you are in a different location than where you actually are. It's often used to access content and services like Netflix where different content is available based on what country you're in. But lately people are getting more and more concerned that recent government changes will impact what they're able to see on the internet and having a harder time accessing the content that they want to see. And one of the surefire ways to make sure you can bypass these changes is to connect to a VPN to shield your location information, and personally I use private internet access. It's been downloaded over 30 million times and it has an independently audited no logs policy, so that means that you can be sure they're not going to store any of your data. And Private Internet Access has been generous enough to give me a special link that you can use to get 83% off of their typical pricing, bringing it down to just over $2 per month with a bonus 4 months for free and all of this has a 30 day money back guarantee. So make sure to use the link in the description so that you can check out Private Internet Access today. So here's the document that was released last week, and it makes me believe that we could see a world where the Bank of Canada ignores the potential impact on housing prices and could set off another frenzy. Now, this document is something that the Bank of Canada started putting out just over the past year that gives us more insight into what all of the board members thought and talked about uh, to each other uh, before making the decision on whether to keep rates the same or to raise them or to lower them. 
And while they were talking about this decision, while well, they actually mentioned something really interesting that I think is uh, a lot of people haven't noticed here. They said members noted that if financial conditions eased prematurely, that means if interest rates were to come down, if they were to ease interest rates, the housing market could rebound, further fueling shelter price pressures. Um, that's the first statement saying, okay, if we lower rates too quickly, well, it could pump real estate prices. But here is the, the, the sort of kicker. They agreed that monetary policy, the things that the Bank of Canada can control, could not solve the structural shortage of supply in the housing market. Hmm. This monetary policy can't solve supply shortages statement makes me think that, okay, they're sort of saying, uh, well, it's not our fault that housing prices are the way that they are, and we can't really heavily consider them when it comes to making our interest rate decisions. So in a hypothetical future where rates are lowered, that would allow for cheaper mortgages and home prices to tick up, and it seems likely that the Bank of Canada wouldn't too heavily consider that when making that decision on whether or not to raise or, or whether or not to, to cut rates or, or lower them in the year to come. But that would only happen if rates are cut. And you might be thinking, Russell, I, I don't really think that's going to happen. Just look at what the Bank of Canada is saying. They've recently said, hey, now's not the time to cut rates. We've got to make sure that inflation is absolutely gone. So we're not going to cut rates until we are absolutely certain we're not going to see a resurgence of inflation because then we could get into a way worse situation like the one that we saw in the 70s. But this is where the Bank of Canada is taking a different course than its neighbor country to the south. Take a look at this article. It says the Federal Reserve, that's the equivalent of the Bank of Canada in the States, expects to cut interest rates next year, uh, coming straight out and saying it. And this is coming from Jerome Powell, who is the sort of uh, Tiff Macklem or the governor of the Bank of Canada for the Federal Reserve in the States. But again, at the very same time, the Bank of Canada is saying, well, now is not the time to discuss rates, even though many Canadians, especially those with hefty renewing mortgages, really hope that rates are going to come down, right? Now, typically, the Bank of Canada tends to take a similar path to the Federal Reserve because that has some benefits, admittedly. It keeps both countries sort of economically uh, similar in terms of their economic situation, and it keeps the Canadian dollar more stable relative to the U.S. dollar. But just after the press conference that we've been watching, the Bank of Canada was questioned on this sort of parting of ways from their counterpart in the States. Take a look at this. I was wondering if you could comment on where you see Canada in the cycle versus the United States. Um, well, the first thing I want to stress is that <clears throat> we have our own currency in this country, we have a flexible exchange rate, and that means we can run our own monetary policy in Canada that is geared to the circumstances in Canada. And so the Fed's going to do what they need to do. We're going to focus on what needs to be done here in Canada. Um, and you know, the question everybody is asking is, you know, when are you going to lower interest rates? Uh, and everybody would like us to put it on a calendar. And if you can tell me what inflation is going to be, you can tell me what growth is going to be, you can, you can tell me all those things, I could put it on a calendar. But you know, we have a forecast, but there's uncertainty around forecasts. What I can be really clear about are the conditions under which we will begin discussing cutting interest rates. We have not started having that discussion because it's too early to have that discussion. We're still discussing whether we've raised interest rates enough. So he makes it seem like the Bank of Canada is far more hawkish, whereas the Fed is more dovish. That, of course, meaning hawkish, uh, saying that, okay, we're more likely to keep rates high to sort of tighten the economy versus dovish, meaning that, okay, it's more likely for us to lower rates and sort of help and stimulate the economy, sort of open things up. But I personally question whether or not this is true or, or if it's just a show that the governor is putting on because it has to do with the other tool that the Bank of Canada has that I mentioned earlier, and that's forward guidance. Now, forward guidance is essentially what the Bank of Canada says. Uh, the, the statements that the Bank of Canada makes has an impact on what Canadians do, of course. If they tell you we're not going to lower rates, well, then maybe more Canadians are going to act like they're not going to lower rates and they're going to keep their spending range in expecting higher mortgage rates and a higher cost of living, right? Uh, whereas on the flip side, if the Bank of Canada were to say, we're going to cut rates this year, well then maybe some Canadians would try to uh, get ahead of it. Maybe they lock in more variable rate mortgages knowing that rates are going to come down. Maybe they'd start spending again with a uh, better prospects on the future for the economy. 
what the Bank of Canada says, along with all other central banks, what they say, that matters. But sometimes it means that they'll sort of bend the truth a little bit, right? If you project that you'll cut rates, like I said, but are unsure inflation will stay down, well, there's no way that you're going to tell people that you think you'll be cutting rates. Otherwise, they might start acting like you've already cut rates ahead of time. And that's exactly what the Fed has seen in the USA. A lot of people sort of jumping the gun and trying to get ahead of when the Federal Reserve would cut rates. Just look at the S&P 500. This is a basket of the 500 largest, most successful companies in the States. And well, the value of the S&P 500 has gone up by about 25% this year, which is pretty insane for one year's return. And a lot of that has happened more recently, right? If we look at the one month, up almost 5% in just one month. These, this is largely people sort of trying to price in the fact that they think interest rates are going to come down and the economy is going to be stimulated. But the Bank of Canada is leaving all of the cards on the table. They say members agreed that the likelihood that monetary policy was sufficiently restricted, i.e. interest rates are high enough to achieve the inflation target, has increased. They're saying it's more likely that we've already done all of our interest rate cuts, but we agree that there are still risks of inflation. They're still here. They remain. Um, so it might be necessary to raise rates further. So they reaffirm and say, hey, look out. We still could raise rates here. Now, is that true or is that forward guidance? I'm not so sure. If the Fed begins to sort of start to cut rates, I honestly believe that the Bank of Canada is probably going to follow suit, even if it doesn't match what they're currently saying now. And even if it means, like we talked about before, that we could see shelter price inflation get even worse. Having said all that, I think that there's a warning that outweighs all the rest, and it's a subtle, slow burn type of a trend that we see here in Canada, but I think that it's the most damning for the future of the country, and it is our productivity. We've talked about productivity on the channel before. A lot of politicians look at GDP, gross domestic product, as a measure of how well Canada's economy is doing, but that doesn't give you an accurate picture on the actual humans behind the economy right? To look at a, a better metric for, okay, how's the average human doing? How's the average Canadian doing? We need to look at that gross domestic product per person or per capita. Take the total gross domestic product and divide it by the amount of people in the country. That will give you a better idea of a person's quality of life in the country, how wealthy they are amongst a, a number of other uh, indicators of quality of life. And it's not just me saying it. Here's the governor of the Bank of Canada that we've been listening to uh, saying a similar thing, actually. Productivity growth is what underpins rising standard of living for Canadians. Rising productivity is what pays higher wages. Uh, it certainly makes your businesses easier. It makes fiscal policy easier. It makes monetary policy easier. Uh, as you said, um, you know, we, we have not had a sterling record on productivity. Uh, on a positive note, what we've been really good at as a country is growing our economy by uh, adding workers. And we've done that in two ways. We have two ways. We have very high rates of labor force participation, uh, particularly uh, you know, female participation in Canada is way above the United States. Uh, and we've been very successful in attracting, we have a very good immigration system. We've been very successful in attracting immigrants in the country. Businesses have done a very good job of integrating them. Uh, and. Uh, you know, they're growing the economy. Where we've, our Achilles heel has been productivity. We have not been as good at growing output per worker. He agrees that we suck at productivity, uh, even though it's so incredibly important. And productivity, you can use that interchangeably for GDP per capita or GDP per person, this, this uh, average quality of life for Canadians. But he says, hey, look at the good. And he points to the fact that we're really good at growing our economy by adding workers to it, whether it be via immigration <clears throat> or by increasing our labor force participation rate. Now, that, that's just the amount of people in the country that are actively employed, something that the current government is really, really proud of as they've rolled out affordable child care, allowing both parents to go to work, uh, and as a result, increasing this labor, labor force participation rate. 
But I'd argue that these things that seem good to the corporate, political, and, and banking elite don't actually translate to positive outcomes for actual everyday Canadians. And this is where I start to get really pissed off because time and time again, it seems like these elite are focused on the wrong numbers for actually improving Canadians' lives. Instead of increasing our GDP per person, the actual measure of quality of life for Canadians, uh, these methods that they're using increase increasing labor force participation rate, adding workers, it just increases the overall GDP, which gives politicians and bankers something good to look at, even if it doesn't actually help Canadians. First of all, I think immigration is good and it's a good thing when it's measured and when it's paired with equivalent growth in the infrastructure required to support more Canadians, like housing and healthcare, and when it's focused on bringing in people that are going to innovate and create productive businesses that will increase our GDP per capita, uh, but that largely isn't what we've seen primarily as of late. And at the same time, I love that there's a focus on the reduction of childcare costs, especially because we're in a situation where it's nearly impossible to survive on just one income. Uh, both parents are pretty much forced to go to work these days. But I've got a question for you. Wouldn't it be better if the families could live on a single income like they used to be able to? Wouldn't having one parent be able to spend more time with their children, regardless of that parent's gender, result in happier and healthier children with stronger family connections and values? If our bankers, corporations, and politicians were to finally break this addiction that they have to human stimulus or the increasing of workers to prop up a phony GDP number that doesn't actually relate to good outcomes for Canadians, then perhaps we'd focus more on productivity per person, GDP per capita. With the productivity and wealth of Canadians increasing with a higher GDP per capita, well, maybe, just maybe, we could back, get back to a world where families don't have to forego spending time with their children just to put food on the table. Am I making any sense here? That's why I personally am looking for political candidates that are serious about productivity growth rather than just economic growth and are willing to make it easier for entrepreneurs and for new businesses to grow. Um, politicians that are going to focus more on highly technical industries that have the potential for outsized growth in the future. And uh, as well, politicians who recognize that ham-fisted all-in bets um, by giving m billions of dollars or m at the very least millions of dollars to major industries international corporations who pitch a, a green utopia using the buzzwords of the day, well, maybe that route forward might not be the best focus long term. And I don't mean to be too negative about all of this, but non-government organizations are saying that the picture is even worse because even with the human stimulus that we're seeing, the economy isn't growing right now. Take a look at this. This is from the National Bank of Canada, uh, one of the big banks in Canada. Um, let me read this excerpt here. It says, indeed, the third quarter of GDP data came in below economics, uh, economists' expectations, showing outright contraction. Even that high-level GDP number is going down, not even GDP per capita. But when we take into consideration the population increases, well, actually, our GDP per capita recorded an annualized contraction of 4.4%. Not only is our GDP per capita stalling, it's actually actively decreasing. I, th I think that this is one of the reasons that so many Canadians feel like, uh, okay, why I'm doing the same job, I'm doing the same amount of work, uh, how come my quality of life seems like it's getting worse? How come things uh, seem more expensive? How come my paycheck isn't stretching this far? So you might be wondering, Russell, what can I do to get ahead in a situation that seems as, 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 as drab as this? Well, I say it all the time, and it sounds a little bit vanilla to some people, but you need to do just three things in my eyes. And of course, this isn't personalized financial advice for you, just a jumping off point. Uh, first off, live as frugally as possible. Make sure that you're being conscious about where your money is going so you can save as much money as possible. Now, on the flip side of that, increase your income as much as possible. Possible while continuing to live frugally. That could mean taking on a side hustle, starting a side business, um, or going and getting educated in higher paying fields so that you can make more money while continuing the first step of, of living more frugally. That's going to allow you to save so much more. And what are you going to do with those savings? In my eyes, I think it's best to own assets. Uh, like we can't guarantee that politicians are going to fix our productivity problems like I've been talking about 
about, but we do know that all of these elite have one thing in common. They own assets like stocks and real estate. Uh, one thing that I've been doing is I've been dollar cost averaging or putting a little bit in regularly into low fee index ETFs. Uh, perhaps for you, that's the S&P 500 like we looked at earlier, or if you wanna be a little bit more cautious, maybe you'd look at balanced ETF portfolios like Vanguard's VEQT or, or VBAL. Um, I, I think that as long as you don't immediately need the money and that you have a time horizon of longer than a couple of years, this is probably going to be your best bet and at the very least something to look into. I'm sorry if that's not the silver bullet that you might have been looking for from me, uh, but I don't think that we can rely on politicians to, to fix things, right? Uh, I'm currently not fully convinced that any political candidate that's available to us in Canada is going to be actually able to adequately tackle the challenges of the day, so it falls on you to take care of yourself and, and your family as well as your future family by doing those three things, saving as much as you can, making as much as you can, and owning assets that will grow even as the value of currency uh, diminishes, as we've seen over the past couple of years. Um, not a silver bullet, but I, I think it's the only thing that you can do. But either way, it's going to be very interesting to watch all of this stuff play out over the next year into 2024. And a quick thank you to everybody who's watched these videos over the past year. I love making them and I'm, I'm glad you've watched. If you're not already subscribed, that would be a great way to kick in the, the new year and it helps out the channel dramatically. Let me know down in the comments, what am I right on here? What am I wrong on? I'm just uh, like anybody else trying to figure this stuff out. And as I think about it, I, I post things on the YouTube channel. So maybe it'll help you think about it a little bit better as well and maybe it'll help me point out the areas that maybe I'm getting some things wrong. So let me know down in the comments what you think about all of this. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. And with all of that said, I hope this video helped you out at least a little bit and I'll see you next time.